Hello, everyone, and welcome to Virtual Insights Cause in Conversation. Thank you all for joining us tonight from across countries, time zones, and of course, New York City. My name is Persephone Allen, and I'm Curator of Programs and Engagement at the American Folk Art Museum. As we begin tonight's program, I want to acknowledge that we're joining from and our museum stands upon Lenape Hoking, the unceded traditional homeland of the Lenape Delaware peoples, and we honor Lenape people past, present, and future. Tonight, we'll begin with introductions from our director, followed by a dialogue with the incredible artist Cause and our senior curator, Valerie Rousseau, before closing with Q&A. We are delighted to have such a large audience tonight, and for logistical purposes, we have disabled the chat, but we do hope that you will participate by sharing questions throughout the program using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screens, and we'll make every effort to respond to as many of these as possible at the end of tonight's program. Closed captioning in English can be activated by clicking on the CC button, which is also at the bottom of your screens. Tonight's conversation is being recorded and will be published online at a later date, so we hope you'll enjoy revisiting and sharing it. And our thanks to IT Director Richard Ho for invaluable technical support tonight, and to all of you for being here. Without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to our Director and CEO, Jason T. Bush, to introduce tonight's program and our esteemed speakers. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Persephone. And uh, for those of you who are joining us just now, I'm Jason Bush, Director and CEO of the American Folk Art Museum in New York. And I'm really delighted to welcome you to tonight's program. Uh, this program is organized in celebration of the American Folk Art Museum's 60th anniversary and our museum's dedication to providing a stage for self-taught artists across time and place. We're joined this evening by an esteemed artist, collector, and trustee of the American Folk Art Museum, Brian Donnelly, known to so many of us as Cause. Personally speaking, it's been an honor to shape the future of the American Folk Art Museum with Cause, and I'm one of many who are um, very, very much inspired by his generosity and commitment to the American Folk Art Museum. Cause is one of the most uh, prolific artists and certainly uh, one of the most internationally celebrated and acclaimed artists of our time. His work includes paintings, murals, graphic and product design, street art and sculpture. And this evening we'll hear more about his work, his creative practice and his passion for self-taught art including a promise gift to the American Folk Art Museum by the artist William Edmondson of the sculpture Martha and Mary, which the New York Times recently called, quote, a holy grail of American folk art. This extraordinary work of art was recently rediscovered thanks to the efforts of my talented colleague, Valerie Russo, who is AFAM's curatorial chair for exhibitions and senior curator of self-taught art and art brew. We have uh, literally hundreds of people who are joining us this evening. I'm seeing the numbers populating. And I hope each and every one of you will come to the American Folk Art Museum in the Lincoln Square neighborhood of Manhattan in New York, where our museum, its exhibitions, and uh, all of our programs are free. I also hope that if you're inspired by this program, you'll join me and thousands of other enthusiasts in making a contribution to the museum in celebration of our milestone anniversary. Your support makes a difference. And now I'd like to uh, turn the virtual floor over to my colleague, Valerie Russo. Thank you, Jason. Thank you, Persephone and, and Richard. Um, so our discussion tonight will be taken from two viewpoints, uh, from cause creative practice and then his activity as a collector, looking at the art uh, he is surrounding himself with. Uh, Brian, what a pleasure uh, to be in conversation with you tonight. Uh, someone who is so intensely engaged with art uh, in its various forms and manifestation. How are you? Good, thank you. It's nice to be here with you. And first, I started with this slide. Uh, I really love this photo of you on the train, which is, I think, a nice uh, visual conduit for our conversation uh, tonight. Um, I've always been uh, interested in, in art practices that take place in the public space, uh, the public space as a final destination for the art to be seen, 
as a mode of visibility from the graffiti captured by Versailles, for instance, to urban figures like Ligodi and stickers uh, with tags on electricity pole. Um, in light of your own artistic practice, can you tell us about the evolution of your uh, negotiation with the public space from your early um, years um, when intervening on billboards uh, without a specific public up to a more deliberate audience with recent large cultures like here, uh, displayed in parks uh, in highly visible location uh, like the Rockefeller Center, for instance? You know, I think early on, um, as an artist, you're just trying to exist and you kind of try to figure out, you know, how you put your work into the world. And I think that led me, you know, aside from my proximity to several other kids that were interested in graffiti, it just made me sort of see it as like a communication tool to get the work out there. And, you know, I didn't, I grew up not really having an idea of how a gallery system, museum system works. I just, um, I knew I liked to make art and I knew I wanted, you know, the work to be seen. So I started to kind of find ways to put it out into public and, you know, starting with traditional lettering, like the first slide and then moving into, you know, in the early nineties, painting over advertisements, um, like this billboard and then eventually, you know, like the phone booths and bus shelters you just saw. Yeah, so you, you remarked and I, I will quote you uh, lately to me, uh, you said, I put work on the streets because I saw it as a direct, unfiltered communication, no red tape and accessible 24 seven to anyone. So can you, can you uh, maybe walk us through the difference between these first manifestations, these first uh, gestures in the streets and the ones that are more intentional and, and um, uh, reaching out specific publics like uh, this work uh, in front of the Rockefeller Center? Yeah, I mean, the, you know, the left side is 1995, you know, or 96. Um, at that point, I had no opportunity to get work into the public realm. And, you know, graffiti was my access point, And I tried to utilize it the best I could. And, you know, extreme opposite is Rockefeller Center last year or this year. Um, it's really, you know, when I was doing the work in the 90s, I never even imagined, I just thought, like, I would find some sort of job to subsidize my painting and putting work into the world and um, to have opportunities like Rock Center and Seagram's and you know to be able to do large sculpture in itself I would have never kind of imagined so it's you know seeing these side by side is kind of hard because it's, it's such a long sort of path between the two but I think fundamentally the the idea of communication and reaching people unexpectedly on the street is Pretty much the same. Yes, uh, and uh, I was referring earlier to Lee Godi. Uh, so when when I'm thinking about self art artists like her and uh, even Bill Trader, I sense a dichotomy uh, in their attitude from this deep projection of social rules and a lack of faith in the system, but in the meantime, a strong desire to be visible and not hiding anymore and being unfiltered. And I think there's something about this that um, that is definitely like displayed through uh, your art practice too. Yeah, I mean, I think it's just human nature. As an artist, you want to share the work. I mean, not all artists, some of the artists we'll, we'll look at tonight decided to do the exact opposite, but, um, you know, for myself, I've always had an interest of kind of putting into the world and also just sort of like elbowing out some territory for yourself as an artist. Yes. Uh, if we were going to the following slide, um, which, I mean, this is, it's, it's, a, it's something I, I wanted to ask you, it's to go back for maybe a few minutes on uh, to your childhood uh, and have a better idea of the type of kid you were. Um, so you mentioned something about your family to me, uh, the fact that uh, you, you didn't have necessarily the, the place to uh, to look at art when you were young or what, what was the family context and what your exposure to art was at the time? No, I mean, the stuff I would see would just be really through the stuff I sought out, you know, skateboard graphics and magazines and, 
um, I wasn't really frequenting museums and I didn't, you know, my family wasn't involved in the arts in any way. So, you know, the pictures in my house were very typical landscape, a clown poster, you know, this sort of thing. Um, I think a lot of the stuff I saw was through animation and television and newspapers and that kind of thing, comic books. And I always had this sort of attraction for that aesthetic. Did you collect at this time? You know, when you were young, when you were a child, were you collecting things? Were you? You know, I mean, I don't, better? nothing that you would, you know, I did like most kids did, you know, I bought comic books, um, but I, I, I was a little OCD about the way I kept them and, you know, collecting like garbage pail kids cards and wacky packages and this sort of stuff that was just coming out at that time. Um, yeah, I, I think I always had a, a sense of like wanting to, kind of take things and put them together and but it wasn't it wasn't anything like I would have never recognized it as collecting in any form at that time. But do you still have these uh these uh small collections of things? Not not so much. I mean there, there's a few things but but not really. And and what about uh TV? Was it playing like a large part of your uh, daily lives uh, daily life and, and the ones of your of your family? Is TV a, a a big influence in your life. Yeah, I mean, TV was on a lot. You know, it's a complete opposite to nowadays when you're thinking about screen time and limiting everything. Um, there was no limit for, you know, television being on in the house. So, you know, you'll suddenly you'll be watching a show and then it'll crash in with commercials for toys and other sort of different things that were happening. And what about school? Were you uh, a good student did you like school um not so much i mean you know I, i wasn't a good student to be honest with you i was very sort of just bored and and distracted and you know just thinking about what what i'm going to do before and after school and it wasn't it wasn't until later actually getting you know going to like school of visual arts and being involved in sort of an environment that was creatively focused that i actually started to take interest But everything before that point, I think I just wanted to kind of move through the steps that you were kind of expected to do as a kid and, and get on with it. Yeah, and early on, like before this time uh, as a child, do you remember having models, um, models that had really an impact on you? Do you recall that? In what way? Like um, influential thinkers people? or uh, even like... Uh, you know, uh, stars or uh, people you were- Not so to. much. I mean, I was never really star focused. It was really kind of like the kids in my neighborhood that would leave an impression on me. You know, this kid is a great skater. This kid's good at graph, that kind of stuff. You know, it was, it was more more local than sort of this like idolizing any anything out there. And um As a young artist, who served uh, as your primary sources of inspiration? You talk about local graffiti artists uh, mainly. Yeah, I mean, locally in Jersey City, it's, you know, kids like there was a kid, what, four, this guy, Deuce. I mean, you know, it's not names that everyone might be familiar with at the moment, but, um, you know, as a young kid, I was very impressionable. And, and to me, that was, you know, major to kind of be witnessing just kids, you know, a couple of years older than me doing things. And I think that led me into kind of becoming interested in this larger picture of graffiti and the artists that created it. And, you know, that's why I asked you, you know, if we can include Lee and Futura, because I think they're two very different artists that made such a statement um, through that medium of spray paint. And, you know, it's just sort of, you're looking at these figures and you know everybody's working on their other names and they're kind of larger than life with the the way you interpret the work that that you see and so these works uh, I, i didn't mention it at first but all the works in the the slideshow tonight are works from uh, brian's collection or works that brian has created um so early on these local artists or new york artists became your I would say like your first references or your first models, if you want, but you also had an interest to what was happening elsewhere in the world. Yeah, I mean, I was always looking at a lot of different things, but I think, you know, very, you know, Futura in particular 
was um, somebody that kind of came from a graffiti movement, but then moved into design and painting. And he kind of branched out, you know, he's doing all his work for the clash, doing like commercial work and his personal work. And it kind of kind of opened the door, I think, for a lot of artists. And in the same way that the way Keith Haring existed and, you know, he would do these gallery and museum shows, but then do these large public works and these commercial works like patches and have, you know, pop shop. And just seeing like these different sort of modes of, of being a creator kind of really opened my eyes to there's, you know, a thousand ways to exist as an artist and you should really kind of find the one that suits you. Yeah, and, and it somehow, um you know, later on, you start to look, you mentioned Keith Haring and, and, and Basque and Warhol and, and Claes Oldenburg. Um, so how do you see the connection between these pop artists or um, between, I mean, the, the way they have like conducted their practice and, and yours? Like for instance, the series, uh, which is something that is uh, very prevalent in your work. Um, how do you, do you feel like you are connecting with this tradition of artists? You know, I feel like everything you interact with somehow kind of gets into your head, um, even in positive or negative ways. You know, I like to look at a lot of different artists and a lot of different trajectories. And I think maybe, you know, moving from the graph artist into pop artist just kind of made me aware of, you know, additions and seriality in work and just got me thinking about just different ways work can exist. Um, you know, Warhol in particular. I just, you know, I love this open approach to everything and also fashion and, you know, it just sort of laid a lot of the, the groundwork. But so somehow maybe uh, that was the, this platform being you being exposed or interested in graffiti uh, at first in street art, uh, maybe um, led you to also open your mind to many ways of uh, creating many interests and it was not a limited start you were exposed to a variety of uh, interests right at first no I'm, I'm constantly thinking of like you know circles and how little bubbles exist within you know you always kind of feel like what whatever you're doing is the most important thing but then you realize there's all these people in different circles feeling like that circle is the most important thing and I, I try not to you know, whenever I enter something and whether like how knowledgeable I am about it or not, I, you know, I try to enter completely blank, like clean slate and understand it and put value into it. And, and I think that's, the, you know, the best way of sort of just trying to understand people and the things they make and how to navigate that. Yeah. Uh, I think that uh, I would say like, I, I, I was very impressed when I went to Williamsburg and uh, I had a chance to visit your studio and I'm going to switch to the next slide. Um, I saw on the second floor uh, where you are actually, uh, a few rooms in which you display works from various artists uh, from your collection. Um, let me ask you the question, what, what does it mean for you to live with, with these works and what role these works play in your life? You know, I mean, it didn't, I don't know. It's it's hard to explain. I didn't really set out to kind of build a collection or be a collector or be, even be doing a talk like this. Um, it just sort of came naturally with starting off trading work with friends, and then you start to buy a little, you know, little bit of different works. As you know, as I was able to sell my own work, I was suddenly able to buy other artists' work, and um, I think it really helps you understand artists better to have their works and it kind of like by purchasing works kind of forces you to want to learn more about the trajectory of the artists and for me at least you know because it's on the wall and you're walking past it all the day, you know all day long and it's not something it's not like a destination it's just there and so in, in all those in-between moments you sort of get to think about it and you know I could be on a phone call and then suddenly you know I'm holding the phone but I'm lost because I'm looking at something so you know, I, I, I try to have work around me. I find it just inspiring and sort of like good energy. Yeah, and do you hang your works among uh, your collection? Is it like something that interferes? You know, honestly, I, I think I hang most other people's work. You know, I feel like down in, in the studio space, I'm with my work all day. So 
you know, when I come home, it's just other other work I like to see. And it could be whether it's, you know, peers or the idols I grew up on. Yeah. Uh, and do you frequently change the display of these works uh, in your No. Your <laughs> I mean, I do. I, I, you know, it's, it's funny. Things come in and they go out. Sometimes you loan things and that off, off balances a space. So you, you might change something. Um, I tend to just put a lot of work around me. I don't really think of it as like, this is this great balanced situation that somebody's going to come in and go, ah. I, I feel like it's more often a visual overload, um, but that's just because I want to see a lot of stuff. It's not really, and, and to be quite honest, I hardly ever even entertain. So it, it's far and few that are, that are actually coming to my space. But do you, uh, do you think logically about the pairing uh, of, of these works together? Are you, uh, is there like a, a logical sequencing or uh, a visual uh, pairing that you try to reach out or it's much more spontaneous? No, I would say it's more spontaneous, but then over time you kind of realize how works speak to each other and how, you know, changing a work in a room can kind of change your view on the, the other work that's been on the wall for five years or 10 years, you know? I mean, even just you setting up this slideshow and seeing this Westerman and um, Saul next to each other, I don't know, I just sort of, thinking about justice in two different ways, I would have not made that association. Yeah, that, that, that was quite a pleasure to put the slideshow together, to be honest with you. Uh, so uh, what was, I would say, like a, the pivotal moment uh, in your collecting activity? Because, you know, there's a moment you accumulate things that you like, and then it becomes a collection. And I think that you, you, you are in this phase now that you are getting more selective and so, uh, but what was this pivotal moment, uh, this moment that was like really determining uh, that, you know, going from one phase to another one, something much more like- Yeah, I don't think, I don't know if you could really separate it into phases. I think of it more, um, I guess after a certain point, you just realize that you're, you're collecting beyond your wall space and you're following artists in depth and there's, you know, I think having the work really kind of lets you, or having the work up over a period of time lets you kind of better understand it. And, you know, you just go down rabbit holes. You, you get interested in artists and you learn about their peers and you learn about the generation before them. And um, I, for me, it's a fun journey and it kind of keeps me busy. I don't really, it's the only thing that I really collect. I don't even have a driver's license. I don't drive, I don't, you know, I don't think, I don't know, it's a good sort of distraction. Yes. Uh, can we say, I mean, that many collections in many ways are autobiographical. Do, would you want to say that it's the same thing in your end? No, I don't know if it's autobiographical. Um, you know, yeah, for at different periods, you get into different sort of artists and you learn about new artists. And a lot of times I revisit things that I was collecting earlier and kind of feel different um, when I bring new stuff into the collection. But yeah, I don't know. You, I think as a, as a collector, you grow. Just as an artist, you grow. Um, but it, it's nice to see things, you know, over a period of time and have them hold up. And I don't know, I think the appreciation for the artist grows as you sort of better understand them. Yes, and that you are exposed to the works also on a daily basis. And then you can make these connections that you would not have done necessarily like otherwise. Uh, so in, um, in your collecting process, uh, is it like carefully calibrated in a way that you follow an artist and then you really go into collecting the works or it's rather like following a, something uncalculated as a path? You know, do you think that it's more like unplanned? Like your artistic career is, uh, as you said once, unplanned. Is it? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely path? not. It's not a calculated process, you know, and sometimes you you think you're you just like a specific work and then it sits around and then that really kind of leads you into a sort of more in-depth look at the work and an interest to to acquire more of it I mean I don't know I, I, it could be just my personality you know I, on some artists I get into collecting like all the ephemera and invitations and that kind of work and you know, I think when I was younger, it started with just collecting art books. And, you know, that was sort of my access point. And you sort of build a library and 
that kind of grows into original works. And um, there's no, I, I can tell you there's no real plan Good. about where, where this is going or if it's going anywhere. Um, your collection of self-thought art is very wide ranging. Uh, it includes the works of uh, celebrated and, and canonical self-art artists uh, like Henry Darger and Adolf Wolfli and Martin Ramirez, but it also includes like uh, artists who are becoming better known uh, like Susan King and Ellen Ray. And here you have an example with, with Dan Miller. So we are going to look at more specifically like um, at works from these artists uh, in the upcoming slides. Uh, can you tell us a little bit, uh, maybe we can, we can start with this example of Dan Miller and, and how do you see that uh, the work of Dan Miller have impacted your own uh, way of looking and making art, or do you see similarities between between? Um... No, I, I think just you know, for me, looking at Dan Miller is just refreshing. It's um, you know, I, I feel like right at home with a work like this, knowing that it has no connection to graffiti whatsoever. However, it's it's sort of the way it's built is something I've been so familiar with. Um, but then you know, for him to go from this to these sort of highly marked soft orbs I think is in one of the next slides um I, I don't know I just sort of find it no all right it's not that one no um, which one? Uh, no I just find it you know fascinating it's sort of I could just really appreciate his mark making and the way he kind of composes these images and the balance that they have have you been at creative growth and and see him I haven't no but um but I've definitely become interested in a lot of the work that's come out of there. Yeah. And just also, you know, yeah, just knowing like a, a place like creative growth and what, what they do for people and what they share with people um, that also just reinforces, you know, how great the work is. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and uh, and you, you mentioned something to me about, uh, you know, for you, how important it is to collect living artists. Uh, not even young artists, because in many cases they started like late in life or their first works were not recognized, but there's something about your collection that is also impressive in, uh, in uh, the presence of, uh, of more recently discovered artists in this field. No, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, you know, obviously you see just from a few images that you showed, I'm kind of back and forth and all over the place. I just sort of go where my interests guide me um so yeah the you know i'm looking at newer stuff but i'm also looking at you know like helen ray is a great example of an artist that i was introduced to only a few years ago i know she had the show at white columns and then at um edlin gallery had works and you know once you see a work or say like susan king you know when i first saw her work and I had been collecting Peter Saul for so many years and, you know, really kind of understood his 60s work. And then I saw her work from the 60s and I was just, my mind was blown about how these two things could coexist and have no, you know, you know, there's no connection whatsoever, but there's this sort of build of language that you feel like they should be side by side or they would be showing at the same place. Um, you know, it's interesting to see how, you know, the different categories of outsider or self-taught or contemporary or graffiti artists like you know everyone there's all these different categories that people like to place people in and I, I try to avoid them all yes I think it makes sense uh from uh, your artistic point of view uh, and creative process uh there's something about the making I just want to step back on this one because um so your painting, uh, but you know, but also the making of the large, um, large scale sculptures uh, are controlled. They are meticulous. They are procedural. Uh, they are very well executed. Uh, it's very impressive. I sense the love uh, that you have for the execution of the works uh, and the care for the expertise in general of the makers. Uh, of the work to collect. Uh, and I found that this characteristic uh, is pervasive in many works by self taught artists. And I think we have examples here with Joe Coleman and Maurice Urshfield 
and Ellen Ray. Um, can you say a few words about this, the, the making of these works that you admire so much in others' artists? Yeah, I mean, like say Joe Coleman, seeing these works in person, um, they're mind blowing. You know, I, I still don't, as somebody who makes pictures every day, I don't like understand, you know, he has so much put into such a small space. Um, it's just fascinating to, to look at and the amount of storytelling that's within the works. And, you know, and Helen Ray is a completely different thing, but um, just the way she filters, you know, images filter through her is, you know, it's just, it's great to have things like this to, to look at and just better understand, you know, image making, I think. Yeah, do you, uh, so when did you start to be interested in, um, in the works of Maurice Hirschfeld, for instance? I think that's only in, in the last few years from going down, you know, from Ramirez and um, Wolfley and just kind of finding my way to Hirschfeld. It's, I don't know, I feel like I'm working backwards in a timeline or something, or I front and back. Yeah, and and do you uh, like, for instance, I, I remember we had a conversation about about Dan Miller, and I mean it's quite different, but uh, all of these artists here, like from Joe Coleman, Urshfield, and Ellen Ray, um, Susan King, uh, Marlon Newland, uh, and Dan Miller, we sense the expertise and the control they have uh, in the execution and the making of their works. Um, is there something you would like to, to add in, in how this is important for you when you collect the works of outsider artists? No, I mean, these are like three extreme different examples, but there's such control within all of them, you know? Like Dan, just the way he arrives at a form like this, it's, it's just such balanced perfection. But when you see the videos of him making the work, you know, they, he just, he begins and then just starts moving around the work. Um, I feel the same way with Susan King. There's, you know, she just kind of starts from one corner and works her way to the next. And at the end, she arrives at these great sort of balanced pictures. No. Absolutely. Um, and and they mastered, uh, they, they have mastered their their art uh, the same way you have mastered your own uh, your own creative process too. And I think it's something that is um, is noticeable in the works that you have selected in your in your collection. There's another aspect of um, that I wanted to point out. It's the fact that you are really a striking colorist. Uh, you developed this custom made uh, colors. Uh, these custom made colors. Uh, and they are linked to a complex numbering system um, when you execute the, the artwork. Uh, and I, I wanted to make, uh, I think, a connection between this interest for this, I would say like this expertise in color and the works of Henry Darger. Um, but maybe there are other artists in your, in your collection uh, of self artists that you feel like follow this this path and this interest in, in, in color, in coloring practice? You know, honestly, I don't, I don't know how to really, for me, color is just, color, it's what I gravitate towards. There's no, I never studied color. I never, I don't think about it much. It's just kind of what I put down when I start working around the picture. Um, but, you know, seeing these two works in the slideshow, you know, when I first saw it, it was really interesting. I mean, I, you know, I owned this larger after making this painting, but in looking at the two side by side and thinking of the stalagmites in the cave and, you know, when I was making this painting new fiction, I was thinking a lot about shelter and, you know, places to hide. And um, then later having this darker work, it's, it's kind of funny to see them. Of course, it was it, it was actually not intentional, but uh, it's true when I looked at the format uh, of your piece of new fiction, a piece that you created in 2018 in the darker, I could not help myself but uh, making the <laughs> parallel. Uh, and also with the contrast, um, which is something that Dogger really like mastered very well too, and as well as his uh, use of, of colors. Uh, I found that the parallel was quite um, yeah, I mean, it's probably a lot, a lot of times I would imagine there's just there are these underlying things that made me gravitate towards the things that I, I tend to collect. 
Uh, and here again, another like a good example of a blending by by Darger. And uh, I could not help myself but going back <laughs> to this inventory of shapes and volumes and forms and and seeing like parallels between um, uh, the blending uh, shape and and companion. But uh, this yeah, is yeah, definitely not out. intentional. But um, but yeah, seeing them side by side, I think that should be the next Macy's Day Parade. <laughs> Good. Um, here um, are two canonical works uh, in the Pantheon of Art Brut. Um, so you you make art with this desire to, uh, I mean, it's it's clear to me with this desire and the purpose to uh, reach out to people. Um, indeed, this is a, an entire um, operation behind your art uh, that is designed to get attention. Uh, you seek to establish a connection with others. Meanwhile, artists like 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 Valfi and, and Ramirez uh, and so many of the self that artists you have collected operate in a totally different mindset. Uh, sometimes it's due to a disability and sometimes it's due to a mental illness. Um, either they have, they, are, they have kept their works uh, uh, or they have keep the works for themselves and they have not exposed the works to the public. But there's something interesting in, in this um, very big difference between your own practice as someone who is shaping consciously, um, you know, the uh, intervention in the public space and other artists that you have collected that are really operating a totally different mindset. Can you say something about this? Yeah, I, you know, honestly, I think that might be what's so refreshing for me about the work is to kind of think of these individuals just making it in their own space for themselves. And then, you know, later being discovered or put out into the world by others. Um, you know, it, it's a completely, I, I wouldn't know how to do it. I don't know. Nowadays, you know, I, it's such a strange time when a young artist comes and their work is immediately post it globally and you know it's seen everywhere and um i think i don't know maybe looking at work like this for me is like hoping for a time when you can have like your own space and a, a quieter space to kind of produce and and i think on the opposite they have as well uh, mastered um this space to to keep themselves um, outside of, of this social interaction. I think it's not necessarily like by default, but that was intentional that um, uh, it's like a bit, a bit like they, they, shell, they, they shell themselves in, 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 in an area that is protective too. Uh, so I don't know if they could have uh, produced, they could have been able to produce the works that they have produced with this intensity if they would have been in a consistent interaction with, with others. Yeah, I mean, you could really never say, but it just sort of goes to show that I think as an artist, you have this sort of internal push to kind of bring work to fruition. And, you know, for myself, I think if there was an audience or wasn't an audience, my productivity would probably still be the same. But I do, I do like the idea of, of being in a space left alone. It's maybe, yes. maybe a future goal. Yes, so so yes, it, there's something about about your space that is extremely private too, uh, and that is really uh, going in the opposite direction of what you project as an image of someone who is on every platform and and being able to master all these uh, various interactions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, so maybe if we go to the next slide. Um, so this is, uh, this is a slide where we see the works of Martin Wong and, and Yoakum. Uh, I found it interesting that the, the first artwork you acquired was, uh, was a drawing uh, by Raymond Petitbon, who is self-taught, and that you have a long interest in Martin Wong, uh, who was trained in ceramics, uh, not only for his artworks, uh, but also for his collection and, and preservation of New York City, um, uh, New York City-based graffiti artist. So can you say a few words about, about your interest in Martin Wong? Yeah, I think I know, originally kind of what got me into Martin's work is just his fascination and focus on bricks and just thinking of the city and, you know, store gates and kind of the everyday city observations. Um, 
but then also just knowing his interest in graffiti and his support and collecting of graffiti kind of made me pay sort of a deeper focus on him and you know he tried to start a graffiti museum in New York and a lot of his sort of friends and influences like you know Days and Lee and Sharp were you know guys very active in sort of the graffiti moment and I don't know if it was just from working meeting them at Pearl Paint or or what the the sort of beginning of that was but um I just think you know Martin's probably one of the best painters and it's it's great that now people are starting to recognize that and sort of the works you know being appreciated everywhere is it accurate that Raymond Petitbon was one of your first no I mean I that, that was like one of the first works I bought from a gallery but before that you know I was trading with friends and Right. I think, you know, it, it's sort of customary in, in graffiti to, to do drawings for each other in black books and to trade work. So the idea of, you know, first, you know, collaboration and also trade, you're, you're very familiar with kind of other people's work and owning other people's work. And then, but yeah, as far as like a, from a regular gallery, Raymond yeah. was one of the, one of the first. You know, and I became interested in his work just from the flyers and album art and stuff that he was doing. And he's had, you know, a whole other life before galleries and, you know, but it's just become more and more interesting as it's developed to today. Yeah, so it means like if you were, you would have lived in Chicago uh, in, in the 60s, you would have probably like met Joseph Joachim. And I've collected his works as well as the photographs of Lee Godi, maybe. Do you think that it's- uh... Yeah, I mean, well, a lot of the reason why I think that um, a larger audience is familiar with, with Joachim and artists like Ramirez is because, you know, the guys in Chicago like Jim Nutt and Gladys Nielsen and, you know, we're taking the work and introducing it to, to a larger audience. So these are artists that were getting, you know, getting their opportunities and shining a light on their interests and bringing their their interests into the same sort of platforms that they existed on. Yeah, you, you're right. Uh, and if we take this example of Yokum, but we, we step back and we try to look at maybe the more specific circumstances uh, uh, in which you have uh, discovered the works of uh, Susan King and other like self art artists, what would be the more specific circumstances when you encounter these works at first? No, I mean, as I mentioned earlier with Susan's work, I was just, you know, before I knew that she was like nonverbal or anything really about her, just looking at the imagery, um, I was just blown away. I just loved the work. And I just thought, you know, it would live so perfectly with Peter's work from the 60s. So that was my first impulse. and. Um, then you start to learn more about the artist and see a larger sort of scope of the work and it's fascinating i think her new work is just as fascinating when you look at this uh at these examples here uh what can you say i'm about just laughing because of peter's drawings i mean you know peter's humor even in the early 60s is just i think beyond anyone um i just think he's brave you know a brave artist and always always been that way so having that around and having that energy around is, is sort of good energy all the time. Yeah, and it's interesting because you can see even in the gestures, I mean, there are similarities between Susan uh, King's work and, and Peter Soule's. I mean, it's evident, it seems like uh, they have been to the same school, uh, but, uh, but- No, yeah, but there was never, you know, never any chance of a, a connection, it's pure coincidence. And I'm sure you find this, you know, with lots of artists, I found it when I first started looking at Chicago images, and you know, before that, I was very interested in this a Japanese artist, um, Tadano Yoko. And in the '60s, he made all these pink woman paintings, and then seeing some of Carl Worsen's paintings from that time, you know, when I first saw, I just sort of blew my mind how you know these two sort of people could exist on the opposite ends of the world, making work that kind of have a perfect dialogue with each other. Um, I mean, that's, you know, part of the reason why I love sort of collecting and exploring artists. 
here you have more examples of I would say like this this continuity between generations of artists uh, who have been um, supporting uh, collecting works by self art artists, uh, and uh, you have somehow I would say collected these gen different generations of artists. Uh, we see in your collection uh, it exemplifies this continuity between between uh, these legacies, and I think it's quite impressive. Thank you. Yeah, I you know I don't know I just it's not a methodical thing honestly it's just sort of impulse yeah these works like this is a very good example where you have the work of Peter Sol and, and Susan King and yours um you all have uh you all like represented uh like heavily like cartoons but you do it in your own way I think that uh somehow this is this is a very different take on the reality of uh, of Susan King and Peter Saul. I mean, you you don't see and you don't feel the same humor in the works of Susan King, for instance. What do you say about what what can you say about your your take on these different ways of interpreting and like appropriating uh, cartoons? You know, for me, it's just a language that I've responded to, and um, you know, like the painting in the upper right hand corner all those sort of planks come from these exploding barrels from animations. You know, I, I kind of went through and I screenshot it. Barrels rolling down the hill and exploding. And I just love that energy. And that's why I wanted to bring it into the pictures. Um, you know, when I'm collecting, I'm not thinking, it's almost like two different, two different minds of what I collect and the work that I make. But, you know, as you see, it definitely, it must carry over. But is it intentional for you collecting these different motifs and signs and the way that various artists from different generations and uh, circumstances have interpreted uh, these these uh, different motifs? Is it something that is it's, intentional? It's not, but you know, at, over time you do feel like you can watch things develop within what you do acquire. And um, I tend to just gravitate towards a certain language and you know, the more and more you can kind of piece things together like this, the more obvious it becomes. Yeah. And here you have um, the works of uh, Joyce Pensado. Joyce Pensado, yeah. I mean, using, you know, the same language coming from cartoon, but it's a completely different energy and feeling. And, um, you know, I think I bought the Erased Mickey drawing was when she was in a group show that I curated with Eric Parker. And from there, I just started collecting her work and after meeting her I mean she's just one of the best people um, you can meet so it's you know there's, there's several reasons for wanting to have the work around and here you have other examples uh, by Joe Coleman uh, the first one is Adolf Wolfley and the second one is Henry Darger and also I I don't know, you seem to also have an interest in collecting works that are quoting other artists that have been influential for these uh, these creators. Yeah, I just love the layering, you know, with with these works, especially, I mean, Joe's work, I, I appreciate his work, period, but then seeing him overlap and his interest in Darger and, um, it, I don't know, it just made perfect sense, I, I felt. And here you have um, on this slide, the works of Edmondson, William Edmondson, Martha and Mary, and you have Ellen Ray, which you see like two very distinct, distinct worlds. Uh, yeah. But um, so what you mentioned something earlier, you mentioned that you, you have been collecting works and interested in looking at specific works by artists, but you also have an interest in collecting ensembles uh, and uh, gathering like ephemera, for instance, uh, or uh, various uh, examples by your same artist. So you like the idea that you, um, you, you can have a larger understanding of, of someone's practice. Yeah, I mean, it's not always about like building a church for me. It's, it's more like finding that place between like a church and a library. And, you know, I think, um, like Roger Brown Study Center is a good example of a way to, to kind of see art and appreciate art in a sort of more personal context. And I just, you know, the fact that it's called Study Center and how, you know, you can walk in and you feel like you're in somebody's 
living room. Um, I really kind of like that way of of seeing work. So I don't know, you don't get that from just like the focusing on these sort of trophy works. It's more about, you know, having everything in between and sort of different examples to, to learn from. Yes, uh, yes, it's very important often. I mean, I would say like in the case of self-taught artists, I think it's even more important in the way that um, often you don't have uh, a lot of um, primary sources. Uh, you don't have a lot of uh, interviews with the artists. So uh, being able to gather ephemera uh, and, and, and other documents, uh, it's, it's, it's very important to establish the knowledge of an artist. And I think it's something that is growing, but people tend to collect, uh, you know, the masterpieces more often. And I think that this is very exemplary in your, in your collecting activity that you look at an artist at large and you try to, to build up this knowledge uh, by assembling these uh, large scale collections sub collections within your collection is there something you would you say that when you you think about your um your self thought art collection do you think it as a subcategory or not at all you you look at these works totally melting with the rest of your collection or you try to no it's completely melting i mean i would i would i don't differentiate in any way from one artist to the next i just um just look at the work for what it is you know in itself and i don't know i i find categories kind of frustrating yes well in this is a point <laughs> i hate to break I, I in saw you, you, when your your face popped in i was like oh no what time is it you know um i think for everyone who's with us tonight the time has just been flying by and brian you said of one of Valerie slides that it was a perfect dialogue. And I think that this has been a perfect dialogue. Um, so we want to thank you both so much. And this is the point uh, which we do invite questions from everyone who's with us this evening. Um, it's been really incredible just to see all of the questions that have been coming in throughout your conversation. Um, were this live, I think, you know, we'd all be clapping right now. Um, but I think that to start us off, um, one of the questions that we had was, if you could share with us, Brian, just what advice you would give to emerging artists um, for the next generation? I mean, that's such a big question. Um, it's a tough one. You know, I would, it's, it's, I'd say the art world's a very tricky world to navigate, just probably like any world um, that you're young and you're trying to enter. But, you know, just kind of try to get in touch and understand what you want out of things and kind of how can you achieve sort of the goals that that you see and don't don't let all the sort of distractions take over thank you um, i'm not i'm not here to give advice i almost against it i i i think that um the open-ended, you know, just the open-ended way that you make your work, that you collect is really um, come through tonight. And I'm seeing a lot of questions in the Q&A about the future of your collection. Um, you know, we don't want to ask yeah. you to give away your secrets, but are there, um, are there pieces that you'd like to add or, or works that you're thinking about other artists? No, I, you know, honestly, it's, it's not, it's not that methodical. It, it's sort of, you know, there's moments where I'm, I tend to collect more than others and I don't feel a need to constantly collect. I just, um, it's just, this is where I've arrived at the moment. I don't have, you know, in my mind, I'm still pretty young, but um, maybe not to some of the people watching this, but, you know, I, I figured at one point, it, things will kind of reveal what what will happen with the work that I have and you know I, I kind of consider myself as like a temporary stopover custodian for for whatever I do have in my possession and at some point I know that it, it will go to the next place and to the next place and um, hopefully along that path it'll be seen and better understood by more people. Um, I think the, the language of custodian is really inspiring. And this is an interesting question that just came in. Um, it, if you have any interest in fiber artists, if textiles are part of your collection. No, I, I personally, I haven't. Um, it's not because I don't, I just don't, you know, it's not something, you know, I, I really just focus on 
what I get into and that's not a category that I've really, I don't really know much about. So it's, which is great because that leaves a lot in the future. And, um, you know, I, we do still have these images up. So um, maybe I could ask you, Valerie, to, to um, pose a question to uh, Brian about those last images by Martin Wong or some of, um, some of these final images um, in our final minutes. Yeah, I mean, one, one of the questions I, I had for, um, for Brian was about his idea of a, an ideal museum. Uh, because I think what is very impressive is in your path is the fact that you, you, have a, you have a very rich artistic practice that touched graffiti and painting and sculpture. And then you have this interest in, in, a various, um, in various generations of artists. Uh, you, you seem to have a non hierarchical uh, approach to the art. Uh, then in the meantime, you're someone who is very, um, geared toward excellence and uh, yeah. the quality. And so I, I was like very curious about what would be your ideal museum? You know, I, honestly, it would be many museums. It would be, you know, I, I whenever I walk in, you have to understand when you walk into a space, you're walking into someone else's vision. And, you know, if, if I ever had a space, I would put a disclaimer at the front door saying, this is one person's vision of what's affected him at, in this short period, you know? Um, you know, I, I don't know, I appreciate it all. I, I do like the fact that there's a lot of new museums and I do like going to, you know, like the Met, which has like this tremendous holdings and history and, you know, but it's all, I don't know. It's, it's all positive in my mind. I don't think there is an ideal space. I think it's it's important to kind of keep them all open. And this idea of low heart and high heart and, and this hierarchy within the arts, is it something that bothers you? It doesn't bother me. I just more of like a, the understanding hasn't been arrived at yet. You know, I, I think slowly you sort of see things. I mean, what's happening with a lot of sort of outsider art at the moment. And, um, you know, you have artists like Robert Crumb who exist in this comic world and then suddenly get sort of introduced to a larger audience and recontextualized. And, you know, it was brilliant in the 60s and, and it's brilliant now and new people are discovering why and making new connections. Persephone, do you have? Um... Well, I think, you know, on that note, um, New Connections is really what tonight's program was all about. Obviously, um, these aren't new connections to both of you, but um, for many of us, this was just the first time that we were getting to hear more about these works and to see them in conversation together. And it's great to end with Martha and Mary, which will be on view at the museum next year. Um, you can read more about um, that iconic work in an article in the New York Times. And we just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight for this program. Um, we hope you enjoyed it. We hope you'll join us online again. Um, our One of our next... Um, programs will be a conversation uh, with Valerie on our Multitudes exhibition featuring Martha and Mary. Um, and we just want to extend, um, you know, our greatest thanks um, to you, Brian, and you, Valerie, for this program tonight. It, it was so transporting and inspiring um, and just a window into another world. Um, so thank you. Well, thank you. And I appreciate you having me. And thank you, Valerie.